Alright. I'm gonna define enzymes. Enzyme. Yeah? Number one. Enzymes are proteins. Shape determines their function. And because their shape determines their function, they are temperature and pH sensitive. Alter the temperature pH, alter the shape, alter its function. They control all, 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 all chemical reactions inside the cells of your body all the chemical reactions. Yeah. Number five, they are created and destroyed based on the needs of the cell. Right, watch. If you decide to go on a low fat diet, right, and you do it for a year, you don't eat any fat. You just eat bark off of trees and grubs underneath rocks, right? You lift up a rock and you see a grub and you just eat it. You don't wash it or nothing, you just eat it. Then your digestive tract will stop making enzymes that digest fat. That's why if you went on a goofy diet for a long period of time and then you try to re, you know, reinitiate that food, it makes you feel sick. Do you understand? So as cells use up metabolic enzymes, they're recreated. And because they're proteins, that's a synthesis reaction. So to build enzymes requires energy. You got me? Now. Number six, this is very important. They're specific. One enzyme, one job. Number seven, most enzymes can reverse a chemical reaction. All right, so simply put, enzymes control all the chemical reactions inside the cells of your body. And watch, because different cells do different things, they're going to have different enzymes inside them to perform those different chemical reactions. Say, yeah, you got that. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an enzyme. Real quick, there are basically two classes of enzymes in this class, two classes, right? There are anabolic enzymes. <coughs> what does anabolic mean? <coughs> Bless you. They build. They build, right? And anytime you make a chemical bond, it requires, energy. that's right, and where's, what's the only source of energy we could use? <laughs> and then you have catabolic enzymes. And catabolic break chemical bonds. So what we're going to be talking about in the metabolic pathway is breaking chemical bonds. And when you break chemical bonds, to break those chemical bonds, what do you release? What kind of energy? Eh? 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 Watch. Here we go. What's holding this thing together? Ionic. Not ionic. Covalent. What are covalent bonds? 
That's right, bonds that share electrons. Now watch. When Ernie the enzyme comes in, we'll call him E1, and he breaks this chemical bond, you release electrons two at a time. Say yeah. Free floating electrons, good for you or bad for you? It's bad for you. So you better write this down, better not pout. These electrons are high energy electrons and if they are captured and brought to the right place, you can make energy with them. So these electrons that enzymes break off and break a chemical bond, those electrons are high energy. And the function of those electrons is to capture the energy in those electrons inside a cell and take ADP that's floating outside the cell and pop on that third phosphate and regenerate it into ATP. So what we're going to talk about is how the cell does that. Say yes. You're with me. All right. Okay. So I answered the enzyme question. Here we go. Watch. If you have a glucose molecule inside your cell, to completely break it down, to completely break every chemical bond that's inside that glucose molecule, what do you need? You need oxygen. And when you completely break the chemical bonds of glucose with oxygen, you produce carbon dioxide, water, heat, hydrogen ions, and ATP. These, ladies and gentlemen, are the byproducts. of metabolism. What are the byproducts of glucose metabolism? CO2, water, heat, hydrogen ions, ATP. Say yes. Watch it. When you take fat, what do you need to completely break it down? Oxygen. What do you get? So what are the byproducts of fat metabolism? CO2, water, heat, ADP, hydrogen ions. Say yes. Okay. With protein or amino acids, right? You need oxygen. But before protein or amino acids can be used as fuel in a cell, where do they have to go? Where do they go? Aisha, where do they go? Come on. Jennifer. Noah Condria. Where did you say? The liver. The liver. So watch, and that little amino group, right, that opened up for Menudo at Summerfest, guys. What's the byproduct? Roland. CO2, water, heat, ATP. And? Oh, I put heat twice. Yeah. What else? Urea. Where do you get urea from? Amino acids, protein, right? Say yeah. What are the byproducts of metabolism? There's a question on quiz number two. 
What are the byproducts of metabolism? And you're going to write those three things. So yeah. Did I explain that question? Yo. Here we go. Watch. I did this already, but I'm going to do it again real quick. These guys are the amino acids. Say so yeah. This guy is the amino group. When cells are going to use amino acids to make ATP inside them, Roland, where's the first place they go? The liver. Yeah. So those amino acids with the amino group hanging on it, they go to the liver. And if you look at the amino acid real quick, it's a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen skeleton, and then it's got the amino group hanging off of it. Right? So I simplified, just made it this way. And then you got the amino group. So for amino acids to be used in metabolism, they first have to go to the liver, get the amino group hacked off, that's converted to ammonia, and then it's converted to urea. And then urea gets dumped into the blood and filtered out by your kidneys. Right? So the combination of urea and ammonia is what is referred to as blood urea nitrogen. You've ever seen that on a lab test, bun? Now you know what it is. So yeah. And then what the liver cell does is takes this carbon, hydrogen, oxygen skeleton and converts it to either glucose or fat. So yeah. That's how amino acids are used in metabolism. Boom. Okay, so watch. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to explain to you the metabolic pathway, right? The metabolic pathway is simply a series, a pathway of enzymes that break the chemical bonds in glucose or fat, whatever fuel you're, the cell is using. Are you with me? And there are, are three phases to metabolism. And I'm going to give you an overview right now, and then I'm going to tell you exactly what I want. Say yeah. Here we go. First of all, if you look at the cell, hang on. This guy here. The watery part of the cell is the cytoplasm, right? This is the cytoplasm. Then you have this guy here, the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is the site of aerobic metabolism. What does aerobic mean? With well, a what? Oxygen. With oxygen, right? So aerobic metabolism, the site, is in the mitochondria. So here we go. When glucose gets into a cell with the help of insulin, free-floating glucose will kill you. So that glucose has to be handled. So the first thing that happens to glucose when it gets into the cell is enzymes begin to break the chemical bonds. Are you with me? And this process of anaerobic metabolism anaerobic metabolism, meaning making ATP without oxygen, occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. So once glucose gets into the cell, this process of anaerobic metabolism is going to break the bonds that held glucose together. And when you break the bonds of glucose inside the cytoplasm, you are able to take ADP that's floating out in the cell, pop on that third phosphate, and regenerate it into ATP. And that's exactly what you want to do. So anaerobic metabolism is the first phase of breaking down glucose. It occurs in the cytoplasm, 
it only makes a few ATP. As a matter of fact, it only makes two ATP. You got me? But the big thing is it doesn't require oxygen. And the only fuel that can go through anaerobic metabolism is glucose. So what's the first phase of the metabolic pathway? Anaerobic metabolism. Where does it occur? In the cytoplasm, right? Does it make a lot of ATP? No. Nope. But you, you need to get this. It is very fast. Very fast. So in times of high demand for ATP, your body will speed up that anaerobic pathway to make more of it. But it doesn't make a lot. Now, the next, and this is important, in anaerobic metabolism, it is only the partial breakdown of glucose. Partial. So what's left after anaerobic metabolism is finished, if there is oxygen present, your heart's beating, you're breathing, what's left over from anaerobic metabolism then goes into the mitochondria for aerobic metabolism. And this is important, please. Watch. Aerobic metabolism finishes the process. It complete, completely breaks glucose down. It breaks all the chemical bonds in glucose. But it is slow. It makes ATP slowly. Well, you make a ton of it. Watch. You make two ATP in anaerobic in aerobic metabolism, you make 34 ATP. And would you rather have $2 or $34? Right. Why was it... Um, Wait, I'm counting my money. Go ahead. Um, I've heard before, like 34 to 36. Who Are cares? Okay. I don't even care. 34. I will never ask that question ever. Okay. I don't care. What I care about is that, write this down, tattoo it someplace. The best way to break down glucose is aerobically. Why? It's the complete breakdown and you make a ton of ATP. And that's the purpose of doing it. And what's an absolute requirement for aerobic metabolism to work? Oxygen. oxygen. Where do you get the oxygen from? And, and how, what else? Breathing. Breathing and your heart beating. So what? What? JJ, you're, a, you're an EMT, right? Paramedic, right? Watch. If somebody having chest pain Besides asking for a copay, what's the first thing you do? You give them oxygen. Say yes. Tell me, right? Why are you giving them oxygen? Because their heart ain't beating so good. So what's going to happen to oxygen delivery to the cells? And are you going to be able to make aerobic, uh, ATP aerobically if you ain't got enough oxygen because your heart ain't beating so good? See, that's why they do that. They do everything for a reason. I don't. Sometimes I just sit and rock. Sometimes I stand and rock. I fell off a roof this weekend. This lady that lives in Beloit, right? I help her. She's got this big place out in Beloit. So she got a flat roof, which I'm not a big fan of. But anyways, I slipped off the edge, and I fell like 12 feet down. And I broke my fatty ass. And... You know what's weird about that? Is that, like, when I was 25, if I fell, I'm like, eh. Let's get back up. Now it's like, damn, that hurts. Yeah, where were you guys? Yeah, updating your Facebook status. <laughs> Tell me you follow this. Say yes. 
guys. All right. Now watch. There's two phases to glucose metabolism. The anaerobic phase that occurs in the cytoplasm, say yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the partial breakdown of glucose. And then the aerobic metabolism, which is the complete breakdown. It just takes what's ever left over from anaerobic and completely breaks down the glucose. But what's an absolute requirement? Oxygen. Oxygen. Say yes. Here we go. <clears throat> I want this whole thing. Whole thing. What breaks the chemical bonds in glucose releasing electrons? Enzymes, metabolic enzymes, say yes. And they're specific, correct? So they're little workers and they're breaking the bonds. How many carbons is glucose? I'm waiting. Yeah, that's right. How'd you know that? I read the textbook. I watched the video. <laughs> you watched the video? Yes. I'm, so, I'm proud of you. I told you I watched the video. Honey, you're getting extra credit. Just because you look so cute in that little hat. <laughs> <laughs> she's sitting there. She looks like she's waiting for the bus. <laughs> Here we go. That's very good. Can I just get through this? Good Lord. Okay. If your blood sugar's high, what fuel are you going to use the majority of to make ATP inside your cell? Glucose. Why? Because that's the most available fuel. Dude. Determined by insulin. Yeah. Why don't you come up here and teach so I can ambulate home? <laughs> what up, G? I also gave you extra credit for if you put what up, G? And even if you didn't put your extra credit points, I still gave you 30 extra credit points. Two. Tell me you got that. Anything else I can do for you? Because I'm pretty sure I did that. Did what? Put points I did. I gave you extra credit. Figure out your grade. <laughs> Being all hostile, you know, forget it. I put it in a semicolon. Getting on my central. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I did this weekend too. I was driving home from Bloyd and I flipped myself off. I was thinking about something stupid I did, like when I was younger. And I'm just like, I can't believe I did that. You ever flip yourself off when you do something stupid? No. All right, here we go. <laughs> you got glucose in a cell, right? Free floating glucose will kill you, ain't that right? So when glucose gets inside the cell, what has to happen to it? It has to be broken down by what? Yeah, and what is anaerobic metabolism? Right, that break the chemical bonds, say yes. And these enzymes are specific, say yes. And when you break chemical bonds, in this case, you release energy, and that is enough to directly take ADP that's floating out of the cell, pop on that third phosphate, and make it into ATP. In your book, that thing, that evil thing, that you never read. I do read sometimes. You just lost your extra credit points for looking <laughs> cute now. Yeah, sometimes. I watch the videos most of the time. I do too. You explain it better than the book. Yeah. Do you want me to understand it or just read it? And not know what I'm reading. <laughs> Ty, it gets on my system. The book gets on my system. Yeah, well, guess what? I got mine. You got to get yours. 
That's why I watch the videos. Yeah, well, big wow. Here we go. Then why don't you teach a class so I can ambulate home? <laughs> watch. Glucose enzymatically broken down to pyruvate. How many ATP do you make? Dose. How many? Dose. Dose. That's two. What? <laughs> two. What's left over is pyruvate. How many carbons is glucose? Six. Yeah, because you saw me write a six. And how many carbons is pyruvate? Three. Three. So essentially what you've done is you've broken glucose in half, say yes. Mm -hmm. And you've made two ATP. Pyruvate, when it's formed, liberates a free-floating hydrogen ion. So by definition, pyruvate is really what? Pyruvate. Pyru No, it's pyruvate. It's an acid. It's pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid, good for you, bad for you? Bad. It's bad for you because in 30 seconds it builds up, pH inside the cell drops 6.8, you die. So would it make sense to eat a bowl of fruity pebbles, get glucose into your cell, break it down to pyruvate, form pyruvic acid, and die? No. Now, you better write this down, better not pout. Pyruvate cannot leave the cell. It's impermeable. The only place that pyruvate can go is that specialized organelle. In this, vi this picture, very thin, because I didn't have enough room, called the mitochondria. So pyruvate diffuses from high concentration in the cytoplasm to low concentration in the mitochondria. Say yes. All right. Watch. Free-floating electrons, good for you, bad for you? Bad for you floating around in the cell and primarily found in the mitochondria is NAD and FAD. These guys collectively are called the electron catchers. What do NAD and FAD catch? Electron. I'm writing that down. And when they collect electrons, catch them, they will catch two ubiquitously floating around hydrogen ions. If you write ubiquitous and define it and spell it correctly, there's extra credit for you. How do you spell it? I'm not telling you. <laughs> no, see, that's like you're, you're trying to goat me into showing that I can spell it. That's one word I can spell. Do you know what ubiquitous means? Everywhere are all That's right. Like God is ubiquitous. Timmy's ubiquitous. I know how to spell it. You know how to spell it? But I'm not spelling it. U-B-I-Q-U-E-O-U-S. Oh, man, that's so close. I-T-O-U-S? Yes. Damn, I'm good. What's the function of NAD and FAD? And what do they catch along with it? Two hydrogen ions. So they form... NADH2, FADH2. Are these ATP? Are these ATP? No. no. If I they were, I would have wrote ATP. Is your debit card money? Yeah. So when you go to the store, they say, oh, that's 35 bucks. You cut off a chunk of that debit card. I think that's 35 bucks worth. <laughs> Do you? No. no. These guys aren't ATP, but if you take them to the right place, you can make ATP. Say yes. What's the right place? No, we're already there. Don't even answer. I'm going to explain it. Ready? So watch. What's left over after you enzymatically break down glucose to pyruvate? What's left over after you take glucose and break it down anaerobically? Pyruvate. pyruvate. Can pyruvate leave the cell? No. 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 So where's it going to go? The mitochondria. the mitochondria. And you better write this down. The mitochondria is a double membrane organelle. Oh, yeah. It's got an Audi and it's got an any membrane. Say, so, yeah. Outer membrane, inner membrane. What's the space between the outer and the any? Are the any and the outer? Do 
the intermembrane space. <laughs> Say, yeah. Okay, watch. What's this area here? I better tell you before it gets just crazy. The matrix. And who's in the matrix? Neo. Right. If you put Neo in the matrix, I give you extra credit. Do you understand? It's not Neo, it's Neo. Neo means new. Like neoplasm, new growth. Say yeah. And if anyone changes their name legally to Neo, I will give you extra credit. Tanya, what about you? Okay, here we go. All right. Watch. There are two phases to aerobic metabolism. The first phase is a series of enzymes that break down what's left of glucose and what's left of glucose is pyruvate. That series of enzymes in the matrix of the mitochondria, it's called the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the citric acid cycle. It's a Krebs cycle. Say yes. What's the function of the Krebs cycle? It's a circular band of enzymes that break down what's left of glucose and what's left of glucose. Pyruvate. Pyruvate. Say yes. Matrix. Matrix, yeah. Then embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. It's a series of proteins that shuttle electrons. That series of proteins that shuttle electrons is called what? The electron transport chain. With his pal Spinner and Paddlefoot. You guys are way too young for that. You better write this down, better not pout. The final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain is oxygen. Without oxygen sitting at the end of the electron transport chain, Aaron, aerobic metabolism does not work. Say yes. Where do you get the oxygen from? Heart beating, breathing in and out. That's right. Your lungs breathing and your heart beating. And oxygen, <coughs> excuse me, will go from High concentration in the blood to low concentration on the end of the electron transport chain. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's go back. Let's go back. Wait, that's, why aerobic requires oxygen. that's right. That's right. To completely break down glucose, what do you need? Oxygen. What's left over? No, completely break it down. CO2, water, heat, hydrogen ion. That's very good. Here we go. Watch. Oh, there's a the liver. Hang on, where's the damn mitochondria? Here we go. All right, watch. This, uh, this is the mitochondria. This is the mitochondria. You got me? It's an organelle. So where's pyruvate? Pyruvate's in the cytoplasm. Say yes. How many carbons is pyruvate? Three. Three. Pyruvate diffuses into the mitochondria. As soon as pyruvate gets into the mitochondria, as soon as it gets in there, enzymes act on it and break it down. Boom to a two-carbon compound called acetyl. How many car uh, carbons is acetyl? Two. Two. Watch, watch, ooh, way. Watch it. When enzymes break the chemical bonds that held glucose together, what goes flying? Electrons. And? Hydrogen. And? Carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, right? When the enzymes break those chemical bonds, 
and the carbons will combine with the oxygen and form CO2 and the hydrogens will form combine with the oxygen and form water. That's how you get the byproducts of metabolism. Do you follow that? Do you see this? Guys? Do you see it? So the enzymes that break down the pyruvate. At, that break down glucose, right? When you break the chemical bonds, you're going to release electrons and you're going to release carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. And those carbons and oxygens combine to form CO2, and some of those hydrogens and oxygens combine to form water. That's how you get the byproducts of metabolism. Say yeah. Guys? Yes or no? All right, here we go. Reggie? So let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this whole mess. All right? I'm going to make a big old mitochondria. And this is what I want. What's the Krebs cycle? D define it. Band of electrons. No, not a band of electrons. A circle of enzymes, enzymes that break down what's break left of glucose. glucose. That's right. And what's left of glucose is pyruvate. And pyruvate enzymes came in, broke, broke it down to. Ooh, can't even spell to this compound called acetyl. Acetyl's the key. Acetyl. Tell me you got that. Now watch. In order for acetyl to enter the Krebs cycle, that series of enzymes, it has to be escorted in. And what escorts acetyl into the Krebs cycle? Coenzyme A. Say it really loud. Coenzyme A. Coenzyme A. So acetyl will combine with coenzyme A and become acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is the initiation of the Krebs cycle. Now watch. A cycle is a beginning and no end, right? So how many carbons is acetyl? Two. Two. Already in the Krebs cycle is a four carbon compound intermediate called oxal. And acetyl, a two carbon compound, will combine with a four carbon compound oxal and you will make a six carbon compound. Say yes, who cares what it is. Then, what's the Krebs cycle? A series of enzymes that continue to break the chemical bonds of now the six carbon compound. Are you with me? Who's following this? What's released when you break chemical bonds? Electrons. electrons, two electrons. And you're breaking the bonds and you're gonna form CO2 and wah wah. Say yeah. Now, you got a five carbon compound. Enzymes are gonna work on it. What's going to go flying? Electrons. And you're going to form, watch it, some more CO2 and blah, blah. And now you're back to the four carbon compounds. Say yeah. And then another acetyl-CoA can come in. Crab it out. Say yes. Watch it. So. Have we completely bro broken down glucose? Have we? Have we? Yeah, hey, say yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. You did. So what's left over when you do one turn of the Krebs cycle? Watch it. You've got electrons right? Bunch of them, who cares how much? Right? You got CO2, you got water, you got heat, and you got some hydrogen ions. Say yeah. I told you, and I'll never forget, it was a Monday. Free floating electrons will kill you. Ain't that right? You don't want to die. You want to go to Gateway. Right, Robin? Robin's going to Gateway. She's going to sit kitty corner from Tanya. 
Ready? What's floating around in your cells that can catch those electrons? NAD and FAD. NAD and FAD. NAD and FAD will come in, swoop in, and grab those electrons. And when NAD grabs two electrons, whoops, it's, ah, eh, eh. When NAD comes in and grabs two electrons, what comes with those electrons? And you form NADH2. Say yes. And then when FAD comes in, swoops in and grabs some of those electrons, FAD plus two electrons, say yes, plus two hydrogens, gives you FADH2. So, watch. You are got. They buffers? Say what? Are they buffers? Are they. Yeah, they are. Now, watch. What's left over? CO2, water, heat, hydrogen ions, and FADH2 and NADH2. Say yeah. Mm -hmm. Have we made any ATP yet in the Krebs cycle? No. But what we've done is we have caught a bunch of those electrons when we broke the chemical bonds. Say yes. And if you caught those electrons, which these guys did, and you take them to the right place, you can make ATP. Say yeah. What's the right place? <laughs> What's it called? The electron transport chain. And I'm spitballing, living on a prayer, hoping for something good. What does the electron transport chain <laughs> transport? <laughs> so watch. You're gonna have to take this on faith. I'm not getting into the physics or the you know the physical chemistry of it. You just it is the way it is. Watch. When NADH2 gives up its electrons to the electron transport chain, gives up two of them. As these electrons are shuttled from one protein complex to the next, two hydrogen ions from the matrix get pumped into the intermembrane space. Are you with me? Guys. And each time those electrons are shuttled from one protein complex to the next, two more electrons get pumped into the intermembrane space. Say yes. What's the final electron acceptor? It has to be in human beings. Oxygen. Oxygen. Uh, I needed to make it really good. Oxygen. Say yes. And when those two electrons bind to oxygen, I'm going to skip the chemistry. You can thank me later. They will combine with hydrogens floating around and form water. Are you following this? So what you have done, ladies and gentlemen, is you have set up a concentration gradient. You have set up a lot of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space and less hydrogen ions in the matrix. And the only way that those hydrogen ions can get back, get back to where they once belonged, get back, Jojo, is through this enzyme complex called ATP synthase. And it is like turning a turban. It's like water falling down a waterfall and turning a turban. When those two hydrogen ions go through ATP synthase, that is enough energy to take ADP floating out in the cell, pop on that third phosphate, and regenerate it into ATP. Say yes. Now watch.
Watch, and you need to get this. When these electrons move down and pump the hydrogen ions from the matrix into the inner membrane space, what's the final electron acceptor? Oxygen. And when that two electrons bind to oxygen, what does that oxygen get converted into? Water, right? So in order for a Krebs cycle and electron transport chain to continue, what has to be continually replaced at the end of the electron transport chain? Oxygen. oxygen. That's why anything that interrupts your breathing or your heart beating is going to interrupt oxygen delivery to the cells of your body. And the best way to make ATP is aerobically. Say yes. Say yes. Yes? Yes. <laughs> How many people fo follow down a little bit? Right. You don't learn anything in this class. You collect information, go home and study it. Yeah, you know what she's going to do? She's going to go check her look to see if she, I was right. Do I actually look cute? <laughs> Guys, I want that whole thing. Do you understand that? And if you look in your book on the metabolic pathway, Timmy simplified that insanely. Say yeah. Watch. Oh. Yes. So they just become NDH and fat they go, again, and then they come back. And they come back. So they're like little uber taxis. They drop off the electrons, and then they come back, and they collect some more electrons. That's why if you're B vitamin deficient, your energy level's low. Flavin adenine dinucleotide and nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide are both um, uh, synthesized from B vitamins. You've heard of niacin? Nicotinamide, niacin, yep. <laughs> and then flavor, and flavor. <laughs> Didn't you ever watch Flavor of Love? Yes. Yeah, we were watching that thing. I loved it. I, that was, I loved that show. So that students, like 10 years ago, they made me a clock. <laughs> so I told them I just loved that show. Right? Can I tell you who fell on hard times? I don't mean to judge, but uh, what's her name? The one that was married to Stallone? Who, who is that? Do you remember the tall blonde? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Sarah Pro? No. I can't remember. Uh, wait, it's right after my tongue. It's going to drive me insane. Can I Google it? No, but anyways, man, she did not age well. That woman did not age well at all. Okay. Tell me you got that, guys. How many people followed that? I want that whole thing. Watch. Watch. Who's watching? Is anybody? Watch, see, it's in the video too where I explain this. Ain't that right? Yeah. Watch. Acetyl is how many carbons? Two. Two. How many carbon long are fatty acids? Even. Even numbered carbon chains. Say yes. That's a fatty acid. So fatty acids, fat, when it's used to make ATP, is converted to acetyl and enters the Krebs cycle as acetyl. Does your, do the cells of your body give a ratty, fat ass, hydrocephalic whatever, where it gets its acetyl from? No. No, it just wants it. And it's always gonna get it from the fuel that's most readily available. So if your blood sugar is low, triglyceride is going to be the most readily available fuel. So fat will be used to make acetyl and Krebs out, say yes. There you go.
it don't make no never mind. So it doesn't matter whether you're burning fat when you're exercising or burning fat sitting on your fatty acid. You're burning fat. Say yes. All right. Kill that. Here we go. This is what you need to know. This is what will ultimately come back and haunt you. Does CPR restart your heart? No. No. CPR is simply a bridge to keep you viable, to keep oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain, say yes, mm -hmm. until they can do those heroic measures like shocking your heart, yeah, or giving you some medicine, or making you read a textbook. Say yeah. All right, so watch. If somebody, somebody's heart stops and they're not breathing, what's going to happen to oxygen delivery to the cells of the body? Aerobic metabolism and elect, uh, aerobic metabolism stops. Say yeah. If you don't have any oxygen, aerobic metabolism stops. What's the best way to make ATP? But if your heart stops and you're not breathing, the cells still demand ATP. Is there a way to make ATP that doesn't require oxygen? Yes. And that is anaerobic glucose broken down to pyruvate. Say yes. Now, can, if there's no oxygen, can pyruvate diffuse into the mitochondria and get crabbed out? No. no. So pyruvate starts building up. And if pyruvate starts building up in about 30 seconds, it's over. But your body does stuff that makes sense. So if pyruvate starts building up, it's converted to what? Acid. It's converted to what? I'm waiting. It's converted to lactate and lactate produces less hydrogen ions but it still produces some so lactate that produces some hydrogen ions is really called lactic and lactic acid is a weaker acid and it's permeable to the cell membrane so what can it do it can leave the cell and go into the blood say yes and this process with no oxygen will continue for about four to six minutes, depending on, on ambient conditions. And in about four to six minutes, you will dump enough lactic acid to drop your pH to 6.8, and it is officially over for you. Tell me you got that. That's why when somebody goes down, the key is to start CPR as soon as possible and to try to defibrillate them. The sooner you defibrillate them, the greater the chance they have of surviving. The number one cause of cardiac death, sudden cardiac death, is not a big death of your heart muscle. It is arrhythmia. The electrical conduction system, the heart got jacked up, and it's ventricular fibrillation. So a defibrillator, boom, shocked them. It actually physically stops the heart in the hopes that the electrolytes reset and start all over. Say yeah. Okay, here we go. This question is going to be on there. You know it's going to be on there. You, you know that. Do you understand? This question, if your heart stops and you're not, it's going to be on there. That was pretty obvious. Say yeah. Okay, is there any oxygen in venous blood? No. Confidence to stick with my answer. I'm saying no. Okay. I'm making this up, but not really. There's a hundred oxygen balls in arterial blood. There's still 70 oxygen balls left in venous blood. 
Is there still oxygen in venous blood? Yes. 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 But it ain't circulating. So what do you do? The heart ain't here. The heart is here. If the heart ain't beating, the heart is a muscle. And when it contracts, it squishes blood. So you put up, pump their chest, you pump on their chest, and you mimic their heart beating. And because there is oxygen in venous blood, you will circulate that venous blood. Say yes. Which is why if you're alone, you don't need to give rescue breaths. <laughs> the education continues. Tell me you followed that. Now watch, we're not done yet. So if you circulate that, that venous blood that has 70 oxygen balls in it, yeah? Where is some of that oxygen gonna diffuse by simple diffusion? And what part of the cell? And what part of the mitochondria for cry I? The end of the electron. <laughs> Thank you. So what will happen to aerobic metabolism? It will continue. It will start to work. Will all of that pyruvate that was getting converted to lactate go into the mitochondria? You ain't that good, right? So some of that pyruvate's going to go in and get crebbed out. So what will happen to the amount of pyruvate that gets converted to lactate if you start CPR? It will drop. And if the amount of lactate drops in your blood, the amount of lactic acid drops in your blood, it will, and it will take longer for that pH before it hits 6.8. That's why well-performed CPR can keep someone viable for up to an hour. Say yes. Or waking them up and they can ambulate home. You know what the first thing they'll say to you after they wake up when you do CPR? My chest hurts. Yeah. Or I'm going to go home and read the textbook. So watch. Compressions mimic breathing. That's why for lay rescuers, the rescue breathing is optional. Do you follow that? That's why you do CPR. You ask some nurses and ask them, say, hey, uh, does CPR restart your other? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why you get on somebody. You jump on them right away when they go down. Their heart stops and you're not breathing. That's why you do the chest compressions. And remember, the body does stuff that makes sense. So it's going to deliver the most oxygenated blood to your, to your brain. And that's where you need it so you don't get Dane Bramage. Say, yeah. That's the metabolic pathway. Who's with me on this? Guys, I want that whole thing. Ready? Did you follow it? Guys, why are you looking at me? What? Is Mon Monday's our short day, right? Make it our long day or no? Mm -hmm. I have to wait until Fine, you be that way. <laughs> okay, then let me I do have this. An you got an appointment? Yes. For what? My headaches. Your headaches? I had an MRI Thursday. Now I have to go see my doctor. 
Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Ask him if he read the textbook. <laughs> Ready? He's a woman. Okay, ask, him, ask her if she read it. Here we go. Where does everything that you put into your pie hole, it gets digested and absorbed into the bloodstream of the GI tract. Where does it go first? You weren't really sure about that. <laughs> the liver. <laughs> Goes to the liver, right? Okay, watch. No, you, you need to get this. Do we store a little ATP inside our cells? Yes. Yes. So watch. If you were going to use ATP inside a cell, which one would you use first? The stored or would you make it? Stored. That's very good. So when a cell needs to do something, it's going to use its stored ATP first. Say so yeah. How does it use it? By breaking off that third phosphate, releasing some energy. Say yeah. And some heat. Say yes. What's left over? All right. Better write this down. Better not pout. The biggest stimulator of the enzymes of metabolism is the buildup of ADP inside a cell. The biggest stimulator of enzyme metabolism is the buildup of ADP inside a cell. Say yes. It makes perfect sense. If you're using ATP, what's going to start to build up? ADP. That means in order to keep up with the demand for ATP, you got to break down more glucose or fat to pop on that third phosphate. So ADP, the buildup of ADP inside a cell is the biggest single stimulator of metabolism, the enzymes of metabolism. In your book, that evil thing, ADP is a positive allosteric regulator of metabolic enzymes. Do you like my definition better? The buildup of ADP makes metabolism go faster. I like it too. Here we go. Ready? Watch. If you are sitting on your fatty acid doing nothing, 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 are you going to be using ATP? If you don't use ATP, are you going to build up any ADP? No. So what's going to happen to the rate of metabolism? Drops. It drops. If you're sitting on your fatty acid and you eat a bunch of fruity pebbles, what's going to happen to your blood sugar? It's going to go up. <clears throat> are the cells of the body going to use that glucose and break it down to make ATP? No, because no, you're sitting on your fatty acid doing nothing. Say yes. So watch, any excess glucose that is not being used for the cells of the body for metabolism goes to the liver and gets chemically bonded together and stored with water. And glucose chemically bonded together and stored with water is called? Glycogen. That's very good. What's the stored form of glucose called? Glycogen. glycogen. Where do you store glycogen? Liver. In your liver. Say yes. Who's with me? Watch. Can you store an unlimited amount of glycogen in your liver? No. Yes or no? No. Did you ever see somebody's liver sticking out to here? Yeah, my glycogen. Hey, I gotta watch that. <laughs> so, once you've stored all the glycogen you can store, any excess glucose that can't be stored as glycogen or is not being used to make ATP inside your cell, that glucose inside of the liver goes through the dihydroxy acetone phosphate shunt. I just like saying that. And gets converted to fat and stored in a what? Can you store an unlimited amount of fat in a fat cell? You can be as fat as you want to be. 
Right, but all you do is just fill up those fat cells more and more. Those fat cells can stretch to infinity and beyond. Say yeah. Are you with me, guys? Please get this. All right. I'll just move this. Here we go. What's the goal of the body? There you go. If you don't eat for three days, because you're reading the textbook, I really need to make a scenario that could actually happen. What's in a fat cell? 127 hours. 127 hours? What's in a fat cell? Fat. Good. What's the goal of the body? Good. If your blood sugar is 70, are you in homeostasis? No. So when your blood sugar drops, the pancreas senses that and releases what? They're confused. <laughs> what is that? When your blood sugar drops, the pancreas senses that and releases the hormone glucagon. You better write this down. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin. What does insulin do to your blood sugar? Lower that issue. So what does glucagon do? Raise it raises it. Now watch it. Where do you store extra glucose? In the liver. That's right. And that liver stores extra glucose in the form of? Glucagon. We're going to work on that. Glycogen. There you go. You got all the glycs mixed up. Thank you. Good luck. You got me? What? This is called glycogen. So when your blood sugar is low, glucagon is released from glucagon, or is released from the alpha cells of the pancreas. And you have glucagon receptors on your liver. And when glucagon binds to glucagon receptors on your liver, it breaks the bonds that held glycogen together. So now you freed up what? Glycogen. You freed up glucose. glucose. Where's glucose highly concentrated? Where's it lowly concentrated? And glucose will diffuse into the blood to raise your blood sugar. Say yes. You also have glucagon receptors on fat cells. When glucagon binds the glucagon receptors on fat cells, it actually puts a diving board on fat cells and triglycerides dive into the blood. You said glucagon is released from the what? The alpha cells of the pancreas. So what happens to the amount of triglyceride in the blood as a result of glucagon? And what becomes most readily available fuel for the other cells of the body to use? Fat. And you save the glucose for the only fuel that the... Brain, can you, do you see this? Do you see this? Say yes. That's the function of glucagon. Glucagon has other functions, but that's beyond the scope of the course right now. Glucagon is also used for beta blocker overdose. Did you know that? Yes. Because glucagon increases the force of contraction and heart rate. That video. Oh, did you? That was in a video? Yeah. Damn, that's a good video. Really? Oh, well, make me some money. How many people followed that? Okay, you better write this down. Better not pout. Body does stuff that makes sense. Ain't that right? If you have insulin in your blood, insulin's in your blood, what do you think insulin does to the release of glucagon? That's right. Right? And it makes sense that that would happen, right? Why, if you have insulin, which lowers your blood sugar, why would you have a hormone in it that raises it? Wouldn't make sense, right? So insulin inhibits the release of glucagon. What do you think glucagon does to the release of insulin? That's right.
tell me you got that. Oh, look at that. Oh, how does that work? What are the odds? Yeah. How many people got that? Glucagon inhibits the release of insulin. Very important that you get that. So watch. And you're going to get this. You're going to get this. Yeah? You got mm, grams. She's 82. She's a insulin dependent diabetic. Got me? At night. At night. She takes 15 units of insulin. You got me? And when she took her 15 units of insulin, her blood sugar was 84. Do you have insulin in your blood when your blood sugar is 84? So grandma's supposed to eat. She's supposed to eat some aminal crackers, yeah? And drink a glass of milk. But she's watching Cheaters and it's a really good episode. The guy's not cheating. He's actually working a second job to buy her a car. All right? How come they never show those episodes? Once. You know. And when the woman's cheating, no guy will forgive that. They won't. Do you know why? Do you know why they won't? Women, most of them, only sleep with a guy if they like them. There's emotional attachment there. Guys will sleep with anything. Right? Guys have sex for fun. Women have sex to express emotion. That's why a guy will never forget that. You should write that down. The education continues. Am I right? Yes. I know I am. Here we go. She eats some aminal crackers watching, or she didn't eat her aminal crackers and drink her milk. Then she goes to bed. Go to bed, Grandma. Before she goes to bed, she says her prayers. God bless Timmy. What's insulin going to do to her blood sugar? Drop it. It's going to drop it, right? It was 84. She took her insulin. Now it's going to go 70, 60, 50, 40. Tell me you got that. My grandma doesn't wake up. Why? She wakes up dead. So when her blood sugar begins to drop, what should be released by the alpha cells of the pancreas? But what does insulin do to glucagon? It inhibits it. So grandma's blood sugar continues to drop. And when grandma's blood sugar gets critically low, that's right, that will activate the sympathetic nervous system. Say yes. I want this. I want all of this. What's the hormone of the sympathetic nervous system? Epinephrine. Say yes. An epinephrine, in order to exert its effect on the cells of the body, has to bind to a specific receptor. Aaron, what is it? I'm. Oh, you're in trouble. Epi receptors have a special name. Beta they're, receptors. They're called beta receptors. You got me. You're gonna learn. I want this. I want this, or take your multiple choice and die. <laughs> beta receptors. Beta receptors, you have beta 1 in your heart. Sweat glands. Skeletal muscle. This is muscle. You got beta 2? Where? That's right. And you got beta 3 where? Um, yeah, and? Liver. That's right. What binds the beta receptors? Beta. 
that too. No, you're not wrong. Oh. Yeah, just don't say that. Trip her on the way out. <laughs> Tell me you're with me. So if you recall, now, what? I'm not going to get mad. This is what I want you to start doing. I want you, by, you know, as this class matriculates, to start being able to put things together. Think logically. Why was the sympathetic nervous system stimulated? Because there was a homeostatic imbalance. Or stressed. By the disease. Disease equals stress. Activation sympathetic nervous system. That's good. That's not what I'm looking for, though. Gene. Low blood sugar. Low blood sugar. So what do you think the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine are going to do? Raise your blood sugar. Tell me you got that. But we now know that the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine have other effects on the body. Say yes. So where do you store extra glucose? Liver. That's very good. So when epinephrine's around, and why was epinephrine around for grandma? Blood sugar. Their blood sugar's low. And that's going to be beta 3 on the liver. And what is epinephrine going to do to glycogen? It's going to cause massive glycogen breakdown to what? Glucose. And where is glucose highly concentrated? And where is it lowly concentrated? No. And it will raise her blood sugar. Are there beta receptors on fat cells? Alien. What's it a fat cell? Triglycerides. Well, fat. Yeah, always remember that. You got me? And epi binds to beta 3 in fat cells. So it's going to raise what up, G? And what's going to happen to your triglyceride level in the blood? It'll, It'll go up. And what can the other cells of the body use to make ATP? Fat. And it will save that glucose for your? Brain. Brain. Say yes. Watch. Where, else, where do you have beta 1 receptors? Your heart. Your heart. So when epi binds to beta 1, what's going to happen to your heart rate? What's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to go up. Increase. You got beta 1 in your sweat glands. Don't sweat. That's right. That's a good word. You're going to begin to sweat profusely. Sweat a lot. Watch. These people, I'm not kidding you, if you've ever taken care of a diabetic and their sugar begins to bottom out, that sweat just pours off them. Literally. Tell me you got that. Where do you got where else you got beta one? So what's gonna happen? They're gonna become shaky. So they'll be like this. And they'll be sweating. And their heart be racing. Say yeah. What's your life fuel break heels? If your blood sugar drops. That's why I offered you, I don't know, did I offer you guys uh, lifesavers while you were taking the test? No. Not that it was just the two of us. Oh. Yeah, well next time I'll offer it to everybody because I want to make sure your blood sugar's up. So your brain works good. If your blood sugar is low, the first part of your brain to be affected is the occipital lobe. You get blurred vision. You get blurred vision. Say so, yeah. You will be confused. You will have slurred speech. Speak. And you will be anxious. Tell me you got that. The blurred vision, confusion, slurred speech is a result of low blood sugar and the brain is not getting fuel. Tell me you got that. 
they will act like they're drunk. Right? So a guy came in, did I tell you this? When I was working in the emergency room, and I, I didn't know much, but I knew this. No history, they're unconscious. I started an IV, gave him a Narcan, nothing. Then I gave him glucagon. And as I'm giving him the glucagon, this is no joke, he's like this. And as I'm giving him the glucagon, I'm hungry. <laughs> and we fed him and then he ambulated home. Tell me, you got that. Now watch, this is what I'm trying to do for you. You will never, ever have to remember the signs and symptoms of low blood sugar if you know what produces them. And epinephrine produces them. And if you know the effects of epinephrine, you now know the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Do you follow that? Yes. That's education, people. Do you realize how powerful that is? Do you realize how the quality of information that you just got right there. You have no idea how good it is. That's why, watch, that's why beta blockers are used very ju judiciously in type 1 diabetics. Because if you take beta blockers, beta blockers block beta receptors so epinephrine can't bind. Can you sleep when you're scared? No. So if these people are on heavy doses of beta blockers, they don't get that's sympathetic stimulation, and they wake up dead. Say yeah. Did you follow that? So watch. Epinephrine in metabolism is the same as the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Do you follow that? Watch. Wait. Where's epinephrine released from? I'm waiting. Right, the adrenal medulla. Where are the adrenal glands? Uh, right above the kidney. Right. You know how you know they're right above the kidney? You pee yourself. You pee yourself? <laughs> You're scared. <laughs> Bless you. What does epi mean? Above. What does nephr mean? Kidney. I-N-E -E is hormone. That's where you know the adrenal glands are. Epi, nephrin. Say, yeah. Guys, tell me you got that. Watch. You better tell me what epinephrine does to the amount of triglyceride in the blood. You better tell me what it does to your um, blood sugar and how it does it. Say, yes. Right? By breaking down glycogen and raising it. The other thing that epinephrine does is it increases the rate of metabolism literally in all of your cells you follow now when you're scared are you hungry well. what like if you're going to fight for your life hold up dude just made a cheeseburger. Right? So epinephrine lowers, suppresses your appetite. What does it do to the rate of metabolism? Increases it. Pseudo means fake. Right? Ephedrine is a synthetic derivative of epinephrine. So pseudofed, people were using it as a weight loss drug because what does it mimic? Epinephrine. And what does epinephrine do to your appetite and the rate of your metabolism? The education continues. Do you see that? Tell me you got that. Do you have any idea how good that information is? And if you follow the little 15-week program, what you can leave in here with this class? So just follow it and study, and it will be okay. And here's the thing. I give you everything you need. All you got to do is put in some effort. 
right? And that's what's going to take over there. Yes or no? I'm expecting a lot better result. Quiz 2. Quiz 2 will be... It will be... <laughs> It'll be a, a week from Wednesday. You got me? A week from Wednesday. Whatever date that is. What date is that? The 10th. The 10th. Tell me you got that. Now, listen up because this is true. You need to be on this. Do not mess around with this. I've given you everything you need. And I'll finish up and I'll tell you what I'm expecting. So with the metabolic pathway, I explain what I'm expecting. Yes? Say yeah. Yeah. Right? I, I went over the functions of insulin, correct? I know I did. Did I go over the functions of insulin in class? A little bit ago, yeah. Yeah, but I still went over it. Yeah. Right? And there's a video called the functions of insulin. Say yeah. All right, so uh, we'll end it there. We did good today. This is what we're going to do. On um, uh, Wednesday, we're going to finish this uh, up. You got me? So you need to make sure that you're on top of that. Uh, watch that uh, thyroid and that cortisol. You got me? Say so, yeah. So I went over insulin, epinephrine, glucagon. Then I'm going to hit uh, cortisol and uh, thyroid. Uh, do me a favor, if you took the multiple guests, uh, the take home, turn in, and if you took the multiple guests in class, turn it in. If you want to come and talk to me about it, then you come in early on Wednesday, and I will be glad to sit down with you and go over it with you, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. all right? And guys, look, if I tell you I'm going to do something, and I don't do it, I want you to email me. Do you understand? I thought I put those grades in there. I, I swear to you I did. Because I had those things done Wednesday because I promised you that I would get it done. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And here's the other thing. If I, if I say I'm going to do it and I didn't get it done, I will leave you a note on Blackboard telling you why I didn't get it done. So if you don't hear anything from me and you're expecting to see your grade, then you need to get a hold of me because I don't know how I forgot that. I don't. Yeah? All right. Okay, just turn it in and just uh, put it up here, huh? So when they're in that, uh, that hypoglycemic crisis, are they going to present a fever at all? Uh, they'll be warm. Because of that muscle contraction? Yep. They will be warm. They will be... Uh, um, uh, they're all because of the basal constricting effect of epinephrine, right? They're they're going to be sweating, they're, but they're going to be cold and uh, but hot cold. internally. Yeah. Okay. We had a lady come in. We couldn't. T I I I couldn't tell if she was sweating or not because she had a bucket and was just spraying herself with water, so I couldn't tell if she was sweating. Was she diabetic? She not diagnosed, but she oh. had all the signs and symptoms. I'm sitting there, I have to call them the charge nurse, so I was like, look, I'm pretty sure this lady's either got a blood sugar of 40 or she's DKA, but she has no history. Yeah, she, she was DKA. Yeah. Yep, she was DKA. Two hours later, she was in the ICU. <laughs> yep. Guys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you t if you took the essay, then you uh, take that essay with you. Oh. Then bring it, bring it in on Wednesday before class. You got me, and I'll talk to you about it. And if you can't come in before class for whatever reason, then you make an appointment with me on Wednesday, and I'll sit down with you, and we'll go over it. Say yeah. Yep. Come on, guys. Come on. Yeah? Yeah. No, you keep it. I'm going to keep that. He, he responded to me on there. About what? About some of my uh, some of my answers. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna keep it because I may have I may be doing a little trick here. Cause I copied all my answers that I wrote. And I just got a document. I'm gonna change as I go. Hey, uh, I'm proud of you guys. I am. I am. I'm proud of you. You guys worked hard, yeah? Yeah. Watch. You're supposed to. 
but you did really good. Thank you. I was a little worried about you. Me? Yeah. Why? I don't know. You seemed a little confused, like, when we first started this class. I think because you go fast, and I'm trying to write down as fast as you're talking. Right, but, but you should I watch the videos, and then I pause them, and I rewrite. That's why That's I record I the class. Yeah. I know I go fast. Yeah. Right? Yes. But you're learning something, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. I know. Yes. And that's what I want. Yeah. This stuff will come in handy. It will. Do you believe me? I do. It will. That's what I don't understand. Looks like I did a head strap. Cause I, so, this is true, right? So, like, your body's in stress, so you get disease because I weaken my immune system. So, yep. my stupid sister comes to my daughter's birthday party.